Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just start here. Uh, I haven't had anybody show up yet, uh, but as usual, I'll go ahead and post this. Um, I hear somebody showed up. Let me know if you can hear me okay. I was just getting ready to start. So um, this might be a relatively quick session unless I get some questions here. Um, so I was planning on maybe talking a little bit about the um, unit three assignments here, the problem set three and the um, program assignment three for a bit. So that'll probably be it here. Um, before I forget, um, I just want to remind people um, I had uh, We have to remind people last week on the second programming assignment um, that uh, you probably do need to check those issues that we had for each one of these. So um, you might have to go back through um, the announcements, but in particular, you know, you might need to check that you've got the, the CLang format. Um, um, set up correctly, um, and you've got your VS code set up correctly. So um, you can usually tell those, um, I mean, there's a couple different ways. So for, for one way from a terminal, let me close that off. Let me go ahead and open up the assignment three here. So um, From a terminal, um, you can just look directly in those files. Um, so, yeah, if if you fix these for your assignment, um, these should be like an actual directory and an actual file uh, instead of, uh, they might have been, if they're still symbolic links, if you still see an L here, if you do a long directory listing, then they're probably symbolic links. Um, and um, I showed a little bit of command line stuff last time. You could always kind of look at the, the contents. So, so you should, if you look at the CLang format, you should see it's got a bunch of settings for our class style guidelines. Um, you can also look inside of the that VS Code directory as well. So another quick way to tell. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you don't have these set up correctly, uh, your keyboard shortcuts probably won't work. So yeah, when you first bring up your assignment, let's say bring up the test, you try to do a Control Shift One to do a clean. Um, that keyboard shortcut won't work if you don't have the .vs code um, configuration set up or, or none of those. Control Shift Two to um, to do a build. And Control Shift Three to do a run the test. So, so that's one way to check. Another way, I mean, you know. Um, an, an easy way to check if your the the um, dot CLang format is working correctly is um, if you do any code editing. Um, so, like for assignment three, we're going to be doing stuff in state.hpp and state.cpp. So, you know, if you try and put, for example, like a curly brace at the end, so the 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 CLang formatter uh, one thing style issue that it enforces is that it puts curly braces on the next line uh, indented correctly. So uh, if you save that, it should put your all your curly braces um, on a line of their own indented correctly for the code block. So that's, that's another quick way to check that your C-Lang format is probably uh, set. So and again, if those aren't working, you know, you, you can always run these commands. Um, so it shouldn't hurt anything if you run them, even if if it is uh, set up, but um, so yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions. So I, th I think I've this might be pretty quick. Like I started saying before, um, I'll mention a few things about the problem set three. Um, 
check something here. Check I got the right one of that. So as usual, the problem set should be under our unit three, under the first one here. All right. Um, so yeah, for the first problem, so these are all about the, the chapter, what, um, five and six about concurrency issues, um, concurrent programs. Um, so for this first one, um, 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 well, this won't take people too long. I'm just looking for, like I said, trace, uh, memory traces. Okay, so you know to understand this, uh, imagine these are two programs running, two processes running uh, in separate processes, or two um, functions that are running in separate threads. If we're doing multi-threading, right? Um, so these statements are atomic, right? So for example, I mean, just to give you one, um, uh, if if all of P one runs to completion before the, the operating system switches over and starts running P2, the, the trace would be that V and W, statements V and W run and then X, Y, and Z, right? So that's one of the traces. Um, and then another one, you know, it could be that all of P2 runs before it switches over to P1. So it could be that X, Y, Z runs before VW. So that's another one. Um, but, you know, the, these, these statements are atomic, but after a statement is done, an interrupt could occur or a timeout, like, like a timeout could occur, or the statement could cause like an IO event to happen. So for example, after V happens, the operating system could regain control and could decide to start running P2, right? So I just want you to exhaustively find all the, the possible interleavings or uh, the, the traces, the execution traces of these two processes. Um, And then the second part of the written promise set, um, I ask you to do um, one of these banker's algorithms by hand, okay? So all of the chapter six is about, uh, is mostly about, not completely, but it's mostly about dealing with deadlocks in the system. So deadlocks are a problem that can happen whenever you're doing concurrency. Uh, in a system, so it's particularly an issue for operating systems um, where you need to use concurrency to implement the operating system efficiently. So um, the, the three kind of methods that our chapter six talks about um, for, for dealing with deadlocks, so we could prevent them all together. So that's, that's kind of the first section of chapter six. Um, so we could remove one of those necessary and sufficient conditions. So this is all stuff you better know for the, the, the third test, right? So, so that's, that's kind of the deadlock prevention. So you could do something like remove um, the condition that um, um, you have to um, hold the resource uh, in, until you're done with it. So the process are allowed to hold resources and, and not be preempted. So that was one of the three necessary conditions that we talked about in our videos and in our textbook here. So, um, and then kind of the third one after this is um, instead of either preventing or avoiding, you could just, uh, another way to deal with deadlocks, you could just let them occur. Uh, and then you detect if a deadlock is happening in your system. So that's deadlock detection, okay. Um, but yeah, actually for um, our written problem set, we're doing the, the middle one, the, the kind of the, the deadlock, uh, what do they call it, deadlock, um, um, avoidance. Um, and we're actually doing the banker's algorithm for the programming assignment too for this semester as well. So we're doing this for both of these, right? So this will help you understand the programming assignment. Um, so in particular, you know, you're given this the state of the system um, and I ask you to step through doing 
the banker's algorithm, uh, which is also known as the resource allocation denial. Okay, there's actually two flavors of the deadlock prevention. There's resource allocation denial, um, and then there's the um, process initiation denial, where uh, just when a new process is starting, you make the decision whether to allow the process to start up or not. Okay. The resource allocation denial is different. So in this case, for each request for a new allocation of a resource or a new allocation of a couple of resources, you make the decision whether to allow the process to allocate those resources or you deny that allocation request. Okay. So um, one thing that I will mention on this, so a lot of people often do this wrong here, but like our textbook does, uh, for for the the fourth question here, these are supposed to be a, a, a request for additional resources. So this is normally how resource allocation now works. Okay, so currently, process one has allocated these resources in in the row for process one of the allocation matrix. So it has zero of A and one of each of the other three. Right. So we're not saying that that. After this, that P1's allocations would be 2, 1, 2, 2. These are in addition to what it currently has. So, so if we were to grant this request for, for the, the fourth part of our second question here, P1 would in fact have 2, 2, 3, and 3. Okay. So make certain that you get that right. So this is additional to what it currently has allocated. So it, if, 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 the, if the request is granted, it would end up with two, two, uh, three, three resources for process one allocated. All right, another hint I'll give about this. So a lot of people uh, misunderstand the resource allocation denial that they, they just check each process only once. So they first check if P0 can be run to completion and return its resources if it can, and then check P1. So, so check each one of these sequentially. Um, and, and then they say it's safe if all of them can run, but then they say it's not safe um, if they come up, if they come to one process they can't run. But that's not the resource allocation denial. So what resource allocation denial is, is that you look at the current available and you see if any process can run. So if any process can run, you run it to completion and return its resources back to the available resources. But then after that, you look at all of the processes again that haven't run yet, okay? So it might be the case that initially P0 couldn't be run, uh, but after you run one of these processes, then later on P0 could be run. Um, there's enough available for P0 to be run later, all right? So anyway, that's just kind of a hint on that. I, I go over that in the video lecture about the resource allocation, uh, I believe, um, uh, in the machine up here. So. All right, so that, that was it for the problem set. Um, this one might be a little bit quicker than the previous one for people, not certain, but maybe. Any questions about the problem set from the, from the students that have joined me here? Um, um, in problem one, um, I won't tell you how many interleavings there are, but you know, um, there's certainly more than two, uh, but there's less than, um, I mean, there is like a, a, like an upper limit would be, you could figure out all the possible combinations, right? So, because there's five different um, atomic statements. So the, the possible combinations would be five factorial, because I could use one of the five to run first uh, and then four to run second. So that's 20 times three is 60 times two is 120. So it's less than 120 because not all of those possible in interleavings are valid interleaving. So in, in, for example, uh, W can't run before V, you know, so, so within process one, V always has to run before W, right? So it's somewhere between two and 120. Um, somebody asked um, about the need matrix um, on the second problem here. So need is just the difference between the maximum that you claim that 
that you would need at most versus what I currently have allocated, okay? So if I claim I need nine of A, like process zero says, and I currently have two allocated, I, I need seven more, but I potentially need up to seven more to complete my tasks. So that's what the need is, right? So the full need matrix is just the difference between C and A. All right, good. Other questions? Um, okay, let's... Um, I thought I had this open already. Uh, let's, let me go ahead and open up the problem description here first for the programming assignment. I got to find it here real quick. Uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, we're actually doing the banker's algorithm both for the problem set and the programming assignment. So we're going to be implementing the banker's algorithm uh, programmatically uh, for assignment three. Um, so I suspect, again, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if, um, if everybody will find this the case, but I suspect that, that program assignment three will be a little bit less intensive, a little bit less time needed than program assignment two. But, you know, as usual, you really should start on it today if you haven't started already looking at it. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're basically implementing uh, the resource allocation denial. Let, let me bring up the textbook quickly here as well. Um, so I think I show this in the video when I talk a little bit about uh, this in the lecture this week. Um, my textbook. So um, so yeah, I mean, the three kinds of things that we talk about are prevention. Um, so we're moving one of those three um, necessary or um, or the fourth sufficient condition. Uh, deadlock detection that I talked about. So, you know, uh, you could get questions about deadlock detection or deadlock avoidance on the test. Um, so, so even though we kind of concentrated on deadlock avoidance for the problem set, the program assignment, don't, don't neglect that these are different. Okay, so make certain that you're aware of the differences between these. They have some, some similarities, but, but these are different algorithms. So deadlock detection is just after the fact, you detect that there's an actual deadlock in the system. Whereas deadlock avoidance, like the banker's algorithm is, um, while processes are being created or while processes are asking for additional resources beyond what they currently have, you make a decision that will avoid deadlocks, uh, whether to grant that new process to start uh, for the process initiation now, or to grant um, a new allocation of resources for the bankers out of the, the resource out allocation to that on here. So, um, I think in the video, I kind of, um, our lecture video, I kind of went through the, the same example from chapter six here. So this is kind of similar to what you have to do for your problem set part two, determine the safe state. So for the program assignment, um, we are basically implementing um, figure 6.9, the function to determine whether a state is safe or not. Okay, and then in order to implement the function to determine if a particular state is safe or not, um, I gave you a few preliminary tasks that you need to reuse um, in order to implement the safe, right? Uh, the, the, the member function to determine if a state is safe or not. So, um, so let's, I mean, we're using similar data structures um, so the actual resource allocation denial is that um, um, if there's, you know, there's a request for some new um, allocation of resources, we kind of um, do a, a what if. So what if, if we were to grant that request that that's being made, 
Um, and then we run the banker's algorithm. And if the banker's algorithm says that there's no safe way to run all the processes given that new request, so, so if it's safe, um, then, then, um, then we would grant that request. So we would allow the allocation. Otherwise, if, if this method says that it's not, if that new state is not safe, we would um, deny it, okay? But we're not really doing the full thing. We're only basically implementing the safe or the not safe in the program assignment three. So um, let me start by looking at the SIM file. So like I said, the, the, the SIM files is basically the same as the data structure given in, in the um, textbook, okay? And in fact, I, I believe if I remember right, the, the state one SIM file is the state that is walked through um, in the example from the textbook. So, so this one from so figure six, eight, or maybe figure six, seven, one of those two. So, so that state that it walks through is the one that we're given in our state one simulation for you to, to do testing with. And so, so the, the, the format of these files, um, so you can't have comments. So anything that's a blank line or a, a pound sign in front is just ignored when the uh, simulation reads in the, this file. Otherwise, it expects exactly these lines, exactly these orders. So the first line gives the number of processes and the number of resources. So, so the, this first state has four processes and three resources. And then we give the, um, the total resource vector, which was called R in our textbook. So there's, there's three resources. We've got nine of resource um, of the first resource. So you can call those A, B, C, or resource zero. Um, our our program calls these resource zero, one, and two. So it start it always starts by indexing at zero both for the resource, so that the, the the resources are in the columns and the processes are in the rows, the same as our textbook. But since we're using C, C++, we use zero-based indexing. So we re-index these to be resource zero, one, two, um, and process zero, one, two, and three, just to make it easier so we could directly use um, our zero-based indexing for our arrays here. So, um, so yeah, that's our resource vector. We've got nine, three, and six of resource zero, resource one, resource two. Uh, and then we've got our claim matrix. So process zero claims, um, this is the maximum claim C, okay? So it claims that at most it needs three of resource zero, two of resource one, and two of resource two. Process one claims at maximum, at maximum it needs six of resource zero, one of resource one, and three of resource two, okay? Um, and thus we only give the, the C and the A matrices uh, because all the others can be derived from those. Okay, so if you have the C and the A, you can calculate the need matrix, which is just the difference between the C and the A. And then if you have the current allocation matrix, you can calculate the available vector because the uh, available vector is the difference between the, the, the total resources R minus what's currently allocated. Okay, so like in this example, since if, if you look at the column, I've got two of resource one allocated. I've got nine total of resource one. Um, so there should be seven if we look at the right one here. So let's we'll start at the beginning. So, so, um, so um, if I've got um, nine allocated of resource one and there's nine total, and then there's gonna be zero available. And if I, I've got two re allocated of resource two and there's three total, then there's one available. Okay, so that, that's where the, you get there. And, and that's why we don't have the need and the available vector in the SIM files because uh, those are implied given C and A and R here, right? So, um, So back to the code here. So for example, um, you know, you don't have to implement the load state that's given for you, but this would be a good thing to look through because a lot of the stuff you have to do for the three, the, the, the four member functions, um, 
is similar to what's in the low state. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm jumping ahead here. Let, let's let, uh, before I look at the load state real quickly. Let's go back and look at the um, the header declaration for this the 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 state file. So all your work for assignment three um, is going to be in state.cpp, basically, I believe. In fact, um, I might be wrong, but I think, yeah, this time you don't even have to add any member variables. So again, this might be a little bit simpler than the previous program assignment. Um, so I think I gave you everything this time, if I remember right. Um, so if you look in, in our state class, um, We've got, we're just using regular two dimensional, one dimensional and two dimensional C arrays to hold all this stuff. So we don't use any fancy standard template library um, containers, which um, I don't know. I, it, it, in this case, it probably simplifies because um, um, there's not a real great solution for two dimensional or multi dimensional arrays in the standard template library, which is one reason why I kind of went back to using basic C two-dimensional arrays. So, so anyway, I mean, all of our member variables are things that, um, um, basically get filled in by the, uh, the, the load state whenever we load one of these files, you know, so number of resources gets filled in from the first value in the file, number of processes gets filled in from the second one. Um, and then the resource total, which is the um, the R vector from our textbook, gets filled in from this first line here. So this is only one dimensional because this is just a vector, right? Oh, another thing about this, in case uh, this hopefully this doesn't confuse people, but basically, uh, again, uh, we 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 allocate these arrays statically instead of dynamically. So what that means is that we just allocate these with um, a total maximum of 20 for processes for the rows um, and 20 for resources for the columns here right we might not use all those so like when we use like when we load up this first sim file we're only using the first um, four rows um, um, rows zero one two and three because we've only got four processes right so, so when we load in the um, allocation matrix and the claim matrix, uh, even though we've got enough room statically allocated to hold 20 rows and 20 columns, we only load in um, the, the four rows of the claim matrix. So, so you know, uh, row zero. So you always index the row as the first index for these two-dimensional arrays. So these are matrices or two-dimensional um, arrays here. Um, and then you always, out, you always um, index the uh, resource as the, the column, which is the second index in the two-dimensional array. So, yeah, so, so for this one, we'll only use the first three columns of 20. So, so column zero, one, and two for our resources, zero, one, and two. All right. So that's all that's happening. Um, and that's kind of what we're using for our data structure here. That that's a pretty um, straightforward um, implementation of the example data structure given in our textbook um, for for uh, the banker's algorithm here. Um, and then, like I started saying, you know, you might want to kind of look through the, the load state because basically a lot of the stuff you're doing is going to, you need to, to write loops to uh, go over the resources or go over the processes for these different vectors to create your things, right? So um, um, our load state basically loads in number of process, number of resources. Um, and then there's a, um, um, a non-nested loop, so just a single loop to lo load in the resource total R into the resource total member variable. And then there's a, a, a nested loop that goes over processes on the outer. So, so processes will be the rows, and then uh, the inner loop goes over the resources, which will be the columns. Um, and it reads in from the file into our claim matrix, getting each one of these uh, values. Um, um, and then it gets the allocation matrix. 
And then um, it infers the other matrices by calling the infer state information. So infer state information. So for example, needs, is, uh, somebody asks, is just the difference between the claims and the allocation. So by doing a doubly nested loop over our two-dimensional arrays, we can take the difference of each one of these. So, so C minus A and put that into our need matrix to calculate the need. Um, and resource availability is a little bit more complicated, but we have to add up each column of, of the allocation matrix. So for example, we need to add up one plus six plus two plus zero to get a nine, which is what the inner loop is doing here. Uh, is going over the columns. Um, so, um, so it's going over the rows. Um, Um, for, for the resources, so, so so in this case we processed by uh, sorry by by columns on our outer loop here. So for for resource zero, we add up all of the resources for all the processes to get the current allocation. So so for resource zero, it should add up one plus six plus two plus zero, which would give us nine, right? And that would end up being the current allocation. And then we take the resource total nine minus that that we just added up, which would give us zero, um, and that becomes the resource available. For resource zero and resources available again is a, a vector like total resources so um, we just have one value for each of the resources um, in the simulation um all right so that's a, a um pretty good kind of description overall of, of, of the class um, and, and yeah, and kind of as hint for people that watch or hear or who watch us later, a lot of what you do is going to be similar to the stuff that's done in the load and the infer here. So, so make sure you understand that. Um, so the first task is um, so so the the, the basic banker's algorithm. Or actually, the, the the basic thing to determine if the state is safe or not um, is uh, so. So you keep iterating as long as some processes um, um, are still um, possible. So, so our textbook calls this possible, right? Um, um, So, um, so initially, all processes. Um, so it, it uses kind of like uh, like a set. So, so it assumes that um, that you have like a set of, of the rest of the processes that haven't been run yet to completion, right? And we start by just initializing that all to to all the processes that we have in the system uh, in our simulation. Uh, we do it slightly differently. I'll talk about that in a second here. Um, or I, I have you do it slightly differently. So for example, um, so this loop, basically the first thing you do here, you have to find a process such that its needs can be met, okay? So this is mathematical formula for saying that um, its claim minus, minus allocation, its need. So, so the need for process K um, can all be met by what's currently available, okay? So if you find a process whose needs can be met, so, so if we find such a process whose needs are met, um, we simulate running that process to completion. So what that means is you basically just simulate that you let it get all of the, the resources that it needs. Um, so if you give it its maximum, um, because you can give it its maximum if, if its needs are less than all the current available, right? So if you just give it its maximum, uh, in theory, you could just let it be the only process that runs until it's done. And then when it's done, it can return all of its allocated process back to uh, the now updated currently available. So that's what this, this line is doing here. So if you find a process that needs to be met, you allow it to run, and then you return its allocation allocated resources back to the current available. So notice when you do that, 
there might be more resources that are currently available than there were before, which might mean that more processes are candidates whose needs can be met now um, after a process runs and frees up some of the resources that it had allocated before, right? So, so yeah, if you find a process, you return its resources back to the currently available, and then you remove it from the, the processes that you search. So, so it's no longer a candidate. It, it's, it's been run successfully, right? So you keep doing that, and at the end, um, when no more processes um, needs can be met with the available, um, either all the processes have run, in which case the, the state is safe, so for our pseudocode from our textbook, um, if, if all the processes have been removed from the set here, um, then set is null and that the, then the state is safe, right? But if one or more processes haven't run yet, um, then um, the initial state wasn't safe. We couldn't find a way to get all the processes to run to completion. And so in that case, you need to return false. So, um, so these first three um, tasks that you have to do basically implement the, the things that I just talked about um, um, as, as member functions in order to build the um, is safe method. Okay, so I call it is safe instead of just safe. Right? So needs are met basically um, is a member function it returns true or false. So if you give um, um, if you give a process identifier, so like like zero one two three, so so a process ID um, need, and you also give it the current the the, the current available vector, right? So we, we can we can look at, at the specifics of um, how you call needs are met. For example, if we look at the tests here. So, um, so yes, actually the second test case that you, you'll start with um, when you start implementing the needs are met. So, um, so like, for example, if we load the state one simulation um, and if current available is 0, 1, 1, like it is for the example, the first example from our textbook. Um, so if you ask if the needs are met for, um, available 0, 1, 1, um, it's not the case that the needs can be met for process zero, okay? So again, you know, if, if you go back to them and, uh, or, or, I mean, you can look at the example 6, 8, I believe here. So, you know, the available vector is 0, 1, 1, like we had in that test, right? And so for, there's going to be process zero here, but the process zero needs 2, 2, 2. So for example, it needs two of resource one, but there's zero available. So process uh, zero in our simulation uh, needs can't be met, right? And nor can process, uh, so this would be process two and process three if we're doing zero-based indexing. So process three needs one of resource one, there's none of those, and process three, process two and process three need resource one, there's none available of resource one. But process one, if we do zero-based indexing, only needs one of resource three, and we have that available. So its needs could be met by this, right? So that's what's being tested here, right? So the basic way to implement the needs are met is you have to compare the current available to the need, okay? And you get the need from um, the class, okay? So, so need, um, once, whenever you load a simulation, should have uh, the needs and the, the um, of, of, of the prosody here, right? But, you know, then you need to do a loop. So if I ask, uh, are the needs are met for process zero? So I'm gonna be looking at only at uh, column zero for process zero. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to be looking at row zero for process zero, but I need to look at all the columns. And if I find any, any uh, need that's bigger than this current available, I have to return false. But if I, if I check all of those and all of the um, 
the, the needs are less than or equal to the current available, then you should return true so the needs are met. All right, so that's the needs are met. Questions about that? So if you Im implement that, um, that basically gives you um, that basically gives you this line of the pseudocode. So that allows you to search through the processes um, and see if you can find one that returns true from the needs are met. Right. So, and then if you find one whose needs are met, then we go on to the second class um, for assignment. Um, so, oh, I, actually, I encapsulated that. So um, um, uh, I actually do use two functions to do that first part that I just described. Okay. So basically, what you do uh, in your is safe is you're just going to be calling the find candidate process, right? And it will return um, um, a process number zero, one, two, or three if it finds one whose needs can be met. Okay. The find candidate process basically just needs to loop through all of the processes calling the needs are met. Um, and if it, if it finds one who's, who returns true for the needs are met, it returns that process identifier. Um, so, um, and again, you can look at the, the what, what, what ended up being the third set of test cases, unit tests here. Um, for the, the test of the, the fine candidate process. So we're using, um, um, instead of like an array that's a set of all of the processes that are completed, we use an array of Booleans um, that's false initially for all the processes that are completed. And we set that to true for the process. So if process zero, uh, we find that its needs can be met and we run it to completion, then we would set completed to be true for process zero. All right. So that, that's how we're, we're setting up the uh, keeping track of which processes have run to completion and which haven't. Yeah. Um, and um, the find candidate process should return either a process identifier 0123 or it should return the no candidate um, if no process, if it, if it failed to find the candidate process okay. and no candidate should be defined um, probably at the top of the state that HPP here so right so we just use negative one as a flag um, since negative one is not a, a valid process identifier um, here for our um, for our bankers algorithm that we're doing so. Um, oops. So, so yeah, find candidate process. Um, so, so the needs are met basically takes a single process identifier and that current available vector. The find candidate process um, takes a completed vector of booleans um, and the same current available and returns a process identifier. Um, and then the final one is the release allocated reason, the final one before the implementing the uh, is safe method. Right? So re the, the release allocated resources um, is doing this part here. So if we find in when we implement the is safe, if the um, find candidate process returns a candidate, so if it finds a candidate, then we're going to release that candidate's allocations by calling the, the release allocated resources for that process identifier, right? So it does this. It, it, it uh, takes a current available um, and a, a process identifier, so K here in our pseudocode, and, and adds those allocated resources back to that current available, right? And that's, that's the reason why we use um, a local array called current available instead of the current available in the um, 
so, so if, if you look in the declaration of our state class, there's also the um, resource available, right? But, but this, this just keeps track of the resource available for the initial state. But when we're making the, a safe state determination, we have to update the, the, you know, we're doing sort of a what if, right? So we have to update that current available. We don't wanna mess with our actual current system state. So we, we, we just wanna simulate um, um, by, by modifying um, a copy of this. So initially currently current available when you implement the is safe has to be set, you know, has, yeah, have to be a copy of the resource available vector. But then after that, if you find candidate processes and release their resources, the current available will be modified to add back their allocated resources. All right. So that's what the resource, what the release allocated resources does. Um, so, you know, if we find a candidate process and then we say um, release the allocated resources for that candidate process, which was process one for the current available, which is 011, right? So that is going to uh, release the, this again, was simulating that very first example from our textbook, right? So, so if we re release the, the processes for process one, which um, is process two um, in this example here when we're using index and start at one. It has allocated six, one, and two. Um, so when we release those back, the available now becomes six, two, and three um, after re releasing its allocated resources, right? Which should be what we see here, right? So, so after returning back from this, we get six, two, and three um, after re releasing those allocated resources, right? Uh, questions on that so far? So you're going to be reusing all of these. Um, well, actually, when you do is safe, you're going to be re reusing the last two in your is safe method um, because the find candidate process should be calling the needs are met. But then in your is safe method to implement that, uh, you do have to first start off by making a copy of the resource available. Um, you could use copy vector. There's a method, uh, a member method called copy vector. Um, if you look in um, the, the state.hpp here, um, which will do it for you, or you could copy it by hand, right? Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, you have to make a copy of, of the resource available. Uh, you have to create a list of the completed processes. So again, you know, the, the method, um, um, the find candidate process is assuming that you're giving it an array of Booleans for the completed. So, so like we had in the test before that, you need to have an array of Boolean that's initially all, you, you should initialize these. So make sure you initialize these to all false because initially no process will be completed yet. Then you can have a loop, okay? So, and this loop should be, again, you know, I already talked about this. This loop shouldn't be like looping over process index zero, one, two, and three. But that's not really the banker's item. The, the loop is like a while loop that loops as long as, as there's still candidate processes being found by the fine candidate processes, okay? So, so, um, so, so basically inside of the loop, you call the find candidate process. Um, if it finds a candidate process, you call the release allocated resources to release its allocated resources back to the current allocation. If it didn't find a candidate, um, you need to terminate the loop. So as soon as, as you call the find candidate process and there's no more candidates that could be run from the current allocated resources, then um, we're done in the loop searching for candidates. Um, and then at the end, so, so the final determination of a safe state or not depends on the completed, okay? So, um, so 
Um, um, so I skipped over, but yeah, I mean, you need to do two things. You need to re release the allocated resources back to the available by calling release allocated resources. We also need to mark the, the candidate process as being completed. So in your completed vector, um, if you find a candidate and release its resources, mark it as completed. Right? And then your, your final at the end is if everything is completed, you should return true. So the, the state state ended up being safe. Right? Um, otherwise, if you have some processes that aren't marked as completed, then you should return false indicating unsafe state. All right, so I think that's it for assignment three. Did that, um, anybody have any questions about that 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 prompted maybe? No, pretty clear. Um, okay. Um, all right. So yeah, I think that's it. So as usual, I'll go ahead and get this posted as soon as I can. Um, but um, yeah, as usual, uh, send me emails if you have questions uh, while working on the assignment or the problem set. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys later then.